Hi everybody, welcome. We're coming to you today from Malakadi country in Lutruwita, Tasmania. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country here and wherever you're watching from and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders past and present. Hi, uh, I'm Nick Ritter. Uh, my partner and I um, started Milkwood way back in 2007, Kirsten Bradley um, and I. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the workshop today. Kirsten and also Belle and Paul uh, from the Milkwood team are in the chat. Um, they're going to help out wherever they can. Um, I can see a huge number of you joining from all over the place. So say hi if you haven't already and let us know where you're coming to us from. Uh, we'll see who, who has uh, traveled the furthest to get here today. Um, so uh, throughout the workshop, feel free to ask questions in the chat and Kirsten and the crew will flag them um, so we can answer them during the Q&A session towards the end. Um, yeah, so uh, let's get started and look at what we're going to cover in this workshop today. Um, yep. Yeah. So, uh, first up, we're going to go through a bunch of different things. Initially, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Milkwood and where we are and what we do. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to just step back a little bit and look at what the key threats to household resilience are and how we can, um, you know, what we actually need to address with these different strategies we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about actions versus strategies and what the difference is between those. Then look at why we use permaculture as a framework to actually, uh, you know, provide a more resilient household. Uh, then we're going to get into the meat of it and look at our top 10 strategies for household resilience. Uh, we're going to go through where you can get a whole bunch uh, more resources from. And uh, finally, we're going to finish up with a Q&A session where we'll try and get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. So uh, first up, um, who is Milkwood? Okay. We are a independent social enterprise education provider and we've been running courses since about 2007. We've helped more than 15,000 people uh, from over 72 different countries learn everything from regenerative agriculture to market gardening, natural cheese making, uh, fermentation, backyard veggie growing, natural beekeeping, mushroom cultivation, permaculture design, and a whole bunch more. We've been lucky enough to run courses with dozens of amazing teachers, including uh, farming legend Joel Salatin, uh, fermentation master uh, Sandor Katz, and our permaculture heroes like Rosemary Morrow, and of course, the co-originators of the permaculture concept, uh, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Uh, we were lucky enough to actually spend uh, a few years uh, on Meliodora, David and Sue's iconic permaculture homestead in central Victoria. And a, a few years ago, uh, we made the big move down here to Lutruwita, Tasmania, um, to take our courses online. And we are really proud of our uh, home mushroom cultivation course, a zero waste home mushroom cultivation course, and our permaculture living course, um, which is where we go into a lot more depth about all of the different subjects in this workshop and help you turn the uh, actions into everyday habits. The next Permaculture Living course is open for enrolments uh, next week, starting on Monday. Uh, so if you want to ensure your spot on that course, uh, get your email onto the waitlist. But that's enough about us. Uh, let's get into uh, the subjects of the workshop. First up, I want to take a moment to examine what are the key threats to household resilience so we can address them. There are five threats that we've identified and they're all interlinked and interrelated um, but uh, to just to try to make sure we we cover everything uh, uh, we've divided them into five key ideas the first one is the one that most of us think about straight away um, they're you know disasters like fire or flood or earthquake or drought or war 
Um, obviously, that's a huge threat to household resilience and the one that many, many people, are, well, the ones that many people are concerned about. So, uh, you know, I'd love it if in the chat you can share the threats that concern you the most as I go through this um, so we can address those in a little more detail maybe. So that's the first uh, major kind of threat. The second threat is sometimes a little bit more insidious. Uh, it's uh, poor health. Chronic and acute physical and mental health challenges are a huge threat to household resilience. Then we've got one which may not appear so obvious, but uh, we think is kind of at the core, and that is disconnection. Uh, disconnection from each other, those close to us, disconnection from our community and disconnection from the natural world. Now, the reality is we can't actually ever really truly disconnect from the natural world. That's a pretend thing that we tell ourselves that we're um, disconnected. Everything that we need and have is provided to us uh, by nature, ultimately. Um, you know, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, all comes from natural systems. So you can never actually disconnect from nature. Nonetheless, um, the way we relate in our minds to the natural world is critically important. Uh, the next major threat to household resilience we've identified is financial hardship. Um, the reality is we live in a world where money is important and unemployment, recession, uh, debt, the global financial crises and the like, they all are a significant threat to um, our uh, household resilience. And the final one, kind of the elephant in the room, is the climate crisis. Uh, ecosystem collapse uh, caused by global warming um, is increasing the frequency and the level of stress of all of those other threats. It's increasing the, the uh, frequency of natural disasters. It's affecting people's health worldwide. Um, it's, uh, it's fundamentally a symptom of our disconnection from the natural world. And of course, it's causing all kinds of different financial hardships. So let us know the things in the chat. Um, I can see lots of different stuff coming through right now. Um, disruption to food supply, links to poor health and connection, the climate crisis. Um, all of these are, are really consider, are considerable threats to uh, each of our households. So, um, yeah. Now, as we go through um, this workshop, I'm going to link what we're talking about back to each of these threats with those icons down in the bottom right of the screen that you can see there. Um, so each of those disasters, poor health, um, disconnection, uh, financial hardship and climate crisis. And I'm going to try to link uh, the actions that we're offering and the strategies that we're suggesting um, back to these major threats. So before we get into uh, too much detail about the specific actions um, that you could take, uh, I want to take a moment to examine the difference between strategies and, uh, and actions. So um, actions are design solutions. Um, that you use to solve your problem. Everybody loves actions. We want to take actions to make change in the world. Uh, actions are the individual things that you choose for your particular context. Uh, we don't know your context. Uh, the, your context is possibly very different to other people in this workshop. Uh, so some of you uh, may be in an apartment, some of you may have only temporary housing, some of you may live on acreages, uh, some of you uh, may have a suburban block. Uh, some of you may have really big families, some of you may be individuals, some of you may be living uh, with people who are, move, who are transient through your, your life. Um, we don't know your exact circumstances, so you're going to have to choose the actions that are most appropriate for you. And that's why we don't concentrate on those actions too much. We will list actions and they're going to have these little stars next to them as possible things that might work. Uh, but you're going to have to somehow decide between those. And that's where plans come in. 
a plan is a documented complementary uh, combination of actions. And this is where most conscious decision making usually stops at this idea that I've made a plan, a list of actions, and I'm going to uh, stick to the plan, uh, which is great. It's, it's excellent if you can develop a plan. But you need some kind of framework to help you decide what actions to put in your plan. Um, that's called a strategy of some kind. A strategy is a pattern in a, in a stream of decisions that guide planning. And permaculture overall is a problem solving approach that works at that strategic level. Permaculture provides you with a framework that helps you choose which strategies to, to, to use to solve your challenges, your particular challenges for your context. So what does that framework actually look like? Well, firstly, one of the things that makes permaculture so powerful is that it asks us to examine what we stand for and it suggests three core ethics to live by. Those ethics are earth care, people care, and fair share. Nowadays, they're not particularly radical, and I'm guessing that a vast majority of people um, in this workshop, uh, in the chat right now, would agree uh, with most of these core ethics. And if you already subscribe to those ethics, then permaculture won't be a huge stretch for you. Now, ethics are super important, but to help you make decisions in your everyday life, you also need some of those strategies, uh, some principles to guide you. And permaculture has 12 sort of large principles uh, or strategies to help you decide what to do and what to add to your plan. They aren't rules and they just help to guide us. Uh, for example, use and value diversity, which is one of the principles. Um, diversity gives us resilience. All your eggs aren't in one basket. You'll see us suggesting actions that focus on diversity all through this workshop. It's also really important to acknowledge that permaculture, the permaculture framework, the ethics, principles, and most of the actions they inform are all directly or indirectly based on the wisdom and knowledge of traditional peoples the world over. This is not new information. The point of permaculture, as we see it, is to respectfully use these fundamentally excellent ideas in our everyday lives in a way that works for you, your household and your ecosystem to make life better while actively practicing gratitude to the knowledge keepers before us to whom we owe pretty much everything so you can use permaculture as a lens for daily decision making and for that really big picture thinking as kirsten once said permaculture is a framework for reconnecting with place so if you feel disconnected from where you live and uh, where your community is then we think that permaculture can provide you a lot of those answers. So give that you, now that you have uh, some background and context on why we've chosen a bunch of strategies rather than specific actions and how we decide which strategies we think will help ensure your household is more resilient, let's jump into it and go through Milkwood's top 10 strategies for household resilience. Now, I just want to note that the order we're going to go through them isn't so important, but we'll start with a big one. And that is, we think a major strategy you should take is decreasing your buy-in, uh, trying to reduce your dependence on the monetary economy. Now, this is easier said than done, but if you step back a little bit and examine your life goals and perhaps examine the balance between your work and your life, we think that you can go a long way to actually um, reconnect a little bit with the things that are maybe a little bit more important than, uh, than earning money. Again, this is all very much dependent on your context. We don't know where you're at. One thing that we highly recommend that you do is actually budget. It's boring. Um, it's something that most of us don't get around to doing, but making a weekly budget is a very, very powerful way to ensure um, that your household is more resilient. You know, once you've got a budget, you can start to look at ways which you can reduce your costs. And one significant one is trying to reduce your car use, um, you know, and really examining how much do you need uh, to have a good life. 
One thing that we always encourage people to do is attempt to break up with the, the multinational companies um, that are around you. Um, global gigantic companies um, are particularly uh, unstable and and often incapable to provide what you need when the threats to household resilience really uh, build up. So obviously, if we can uh, decrease our buy-in, that can start to address some of those financial hardship challenges. If we can um, uh, attempt to reduce how much we need and how much we use, then we're less dependent on finances to provide for our needs. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that um, you know, working too hard and, and um, being uh, focused on how much you can earn or how much you need to earn uh, can present significant health problems, both in terms of um, the amount that you're working and the mental health challenges of trying to balance that work and life. And finally, um, fundamentally, uh, reducing your buy-in to the global economy is, uh, or to the monetary economy, is one of the ways um, that you can dramatically reduce your personal impact on uh, the climate crisis, uh, reducing your carbon emissions. Now, that's not to say that uh, the, cl the climate crisis is each of our individual's responsibility, individual responsibilities. Um, there are a lot of much larger factors at play, and later on in the workshop we'll talk about some of those um, wider actions that we can all take uh, rather than just reducing our carbon emissions. So that's strategy number one, decrease your buy-in. Strategy number two uh, is another kind of obvious one that we really think is more powerful if you take a moment to examine it and that is cooking food at home food shared at home is happiness multiplied now before we get into some of the details and some of the particular actions you could take i think the first and most important action to acknowledge is that you need to share the load um, traditionally in most households uh, women have been the major people responsible for cooking food at home and fundamentally um, that has to change. We can't just make another big list for women to feel more responsible for making sure that their households uh, run better. Um, and that's not just the, the actual load of, of cooking and shopping and, and gathering food, but also the mental load of planning and um, uh, taking time to, to think about the management load of actually providing for food in the household. And so some of these actions are going to be uh, too much for you to take. For instance, the idea of baking bread and nurturing a sourdough mother. I mean, it's awesome. It's a beautiful thing that you can do if you have the space in your life for it. And we've got a bunch of um, information on our website on, on how to do this kind of thing. Um, we're going to be providing you with um, uh, a recording of this presentation and a bunch of other resources afterwards, including things like, um, you know, how to make your own probiotic drinks like kombucha and kefir and water kefir. So maybe that producing some food at home isn't just about um, about being a cook. Maybe it's also about um, producing things like uh, drinks and avoiding purchasing uh, things like, um, you know, juices and soda waters and things like that from the shop. Um, but at its most basic level, if you're not somebody who already cooks at home a lot, then start with something simple. Learn to prepare a few staple recipes from scratch. Don't try and do everything, just start a shift from buying pre-prepared meals, buying packaged meals into producing a few staples. Maybe it's a pasta dish, maybe it's learning to make pizza once a week from scratch. Um, that's one of the ways that I, um, you know, focus on trying to make sure that I contribute part of my share is every Friday I make pizza from scratch um, for uh, Kirsten and Ash. And it's something that because I've got into a habit of it, it's not such a big deal. It's something relatively easy that I can do. Another big part of this um, is, is really thinking about what leftovers are. When you start cooking from scratch, um, whenever we cook extra, I cook extra pizza. And that, that way, um, there's pizza leftover for lunch the next day. And that means you can take your lunch to work. It has a huge impact on your budget. It has a huge impact on a, a bunch of different things. Um, and as far as that planning goes, setting out a weekly uh, meal schedule, uh, planning it in advance allows you to budget and to choose, um, and when you go shopping, only buy the things that you need in order to uh, 
get through your weekly uh, meal plan. So uh, this obviously really helps with financial hardship, potentially. Um, it can reduce your costs because you're putting a bit of planning into what you're purchasing. Um, it's also obviously healthy food is, is good for, uh, home cooked food is good for your physical health. You control what's going into it, uh, but it's also good for your mental health because it provides for that connection, that opportunity to share a meal. Um, that's really powerful, even uh, if, uh, you, and even more powerful if you can extend it beyond your household and start to use it as a way to connect with community. Um, sharing food is an incredibly powerful way to connect with community. So that's strategy number two, cook food at home. Not all the food, not every day. It's okay to occasionally go and get takeaway. Um, this is about trying to habitualize positive strategies. The next strategy, number three, is actually grow some food. This is another big one. And a lot of people think, you know, that photo of me on the left digging up, uh, uh, putting in a veggie patch at our, uh, our rental home uh, many, many years ago. Um, that's one option, uh, but it's not always the, the option that's available to everyone. So uh, the, another thing you might do, just something simple, is, is focus on the things which give you the most impact, the most bang for your buck, if you like. Um, so when it comes to growing things at home, the number one thing is leafy greens and herbs. Start a herb garden or grow some leafy greens, whether that's lettuce or baby spinach or um, chard or, or any of um, those fast growing leafy vegetables. Um, they're going, they're the things that cost the most per kilo, have the most benefit to your health, go off quickest in the fridge. So why not have them somewhere in your home, even if it's just a window box, um, so that you can uh, harvest them when you need them. So they're always perfectly, perfectly fresh. You could even try growing mushrooms. Um, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, we, obviously, we've got a course on how to, how to do it, um, but producing mushrooms like those ones that Kirsten um, has got in her hands in that photo, um, it's something that I believe is uh, within most people's grasp. Um, it's not, you don't need a lot of outdoor space. In fact, you don't need mushroom at all. Sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, you don't need a huge amount of equipment either. We've got a bunch of free resources. Or even if, even if you can't do those things and you, maybe you're living in temporary accommodation and all you can do is grow some sprouts, at least you're connecting with your food system a little more. Obviously, homegrown food is fantastic for your health and having veggies in the ground is one of the most amazing ways to uh, ride out the shocks in uh, food prices when um, those big disasters come. You know, it's the, the classic, um, you know, having potatoes in the ground is a great way uh, to uh, ensure your food supply. And of course, uh, there's no such uh, thing as more local food than the local food from your garden. Um, transport and uh, the shipping of food all over the world is one of the major things that contributes in large scale agriculture. It's one of the major things that um, contribute to the climate crisis. So that's strategy number three, grow some food. Don't aim for self-sufficiency. The goal here is not to do everything yourself. Um, support people in your community who grow food and try and grow a little bit yourself. Strategy number four is feed the soil because healthy soil equals healthy people. Um, so Ash has helped me out there making a great big compost heap a few years back. Um, but compost heaps are great. Maybe it, it's going to take too much effort, too much space. Maybe you haven't got enough materials. So start a worm farm. If you can't compost, um, uh, you can't create a compost heap. But everything, all things that have lived can pretty much go back through a compost heap and make their way back into the soil. Uh, so I want everybody in uh, this workshop to make a commitment to stop sending compostable material to landfill. Uh, it's one of the major things you can do uh, to, um, uh, to help the environment. Um, it's really good for your health, obviously, because if you can keep the soil healthy, the food that you grow from it will be. It connects you fundamentally with the natural world and grounds you, grounds you in the earth. And it's also, uh, you know, if you can get those compostables out of landfill, it reduces um, methane emissions from landfill, which is one of the major contributors, 300 times more uh, potent than carbon dioxide uh, methane emissions. And most of those come from a combination of large scale animal agriculture and um, and 
uh, green material in, in landfill and the like. So uh, feeding the soil helps address those major threats to household resilience. Strategy number five is preserve the harvest. Um, make life long, long life food. Uh, look at ways that you can extend that. So there's some um, some amazing uh, pickles that Kirsten and I made a little while back, um, lacto-ferment pickles. So maybe you're going to do traditional vinegar pickles. Uh, maybe you can get into canning or preserving. Uh, maybe it's going to be dehydrating. Um, or maybe just like those uh, fermented uh, lacto-ferment pickles um, there, you can get into fermenting some food. All of those um, different actions can extend your harvest of homegrown foods so they last for a longer period of time. And people the world over have done that as a way to make sure they have something to ride out uh, major disasters, but also to save a lot of money. Um, you know, buying things when they're in season and then preserving them is a way that you can reduce your costs considerably. You're not going to get cucumbers in the middle of winter, not fresh ones, not local ones, unless you've um, fermented them, you've made um, your pickles uh, in the end, towards the end of summer, and then you'll be able to stretch that harvest all the way through the year. And of course, uh, fermented foods also have that bonus of boosting your gut health and um, improving your microbiome. Uh, so they're good for your health as well. So that's strategy number five, preserve your har harvest. Uh, five down, five more to go. Pr strategy number six is get water wise. Uh, sort out your water security. You can't live very long without access to fresh water. Um, so one of the things that we recommend that you do, one of the actions that you can take is actually just audit your water use. Where does it come from and how much do you use on different parts? Now gardens are big consumers of water. Um, so water saving uh, techniques that you use in your garden can be a really powerful way to reduce your overall water consumption because that's what we want to do. We basically want to reduce our dependence on individual sources. We're not going to say cut off from the municipal water, um, the council water supply. It's super valuable as one of the diverse ways that you can provide for your water. Remember, resilience comes from diversity, um, but try to work out ways that you can reduce that dependence. One thing you can do is you can harvest and store rainwater. Um, we've actually did a, a mini workshop on that uh, last year uh, with a video and slides and a whole bunch of resources on how you can harvest some rainwater. Uh, look out in your email for uh, links to that um, tomorrow. You can also reuse grey water, you can mulch, you can go through, use a whole bunch of different techniques um, to uh, improve your water security. Um, Again, this builds fundamental links back to the natural world. If you have a water tank and it's raining, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, great, my water tanks are filling up. Um, that's helping provide resilience and stability in, in my home. Um, also, obviously, uh, when a natural disaster comes, um, water supply is often threatened, uh, especially uh, you know, fires, floods, earthquakes, they all have major impacts on um, the water supply system. So having a little bit in reserve, even if that's just a small tank uh, that's connected to a small clean part of your roof. Um, or some people in the Northern Hemisphere might be thinking, what's a tank? We're talking about a cistern, a rainwater cistern, system, cistern. Or in the UK, some people refer to them as a water butt. Um, some kind of small, uh, approximately you know, 250 gallons, 1,000 litres, um, is enough water to provide for your family's drinking uh, supply for weeks and weeks and weeks and uh, enough water to cook with. And they're the main key uh, reasons you need it. So strategy number six, sort out your water. Uh, strategy number seven, sort out your energy. What happens if the grid goes down? Um, audit and reduce your energy use, just like water. Um, the less that you require, uh, the more, um, the easier it is for you to find alternatives. Um, that's a picture of a little tiny house we built when we lived back on the farm up in New South Wales. Um, and uh, it was super focused on uh, harvesting energy from as many different sources as possible. Not only did it harvest rainwater on those big flat roofs, but it also harvested solar energy to heat that water. It, it harvested solar energy into um, 
uh, solar panels, it harvested solar energy through passive solar design. Um, but before you get into those big things, you should focus on where you can get bang for the buck. And that's start with looking at your home's efficiency. The number one thing that you can do, especially for homes in Australia, where they've really just been designed like cardboard boxes, is improve um, your home's efficiency through reducing the amount of drafts, uh, sealing around your windows. You don't want to get a perfect seal, you know, can't get a perfect seal, but reducing the amount of drafts that come in around those windows, come in around those doors, makes a big impact on how much energy you're going to use to heat or cool your home. Uh, then focus on insulation. Start with your ceiling first um, and then uh, work your way down the building. Um, the, the, most of the heat is going to escape through the ceiling once you've got those draft seals. And then think about isolating unused areas of your home. A lot of people have much larger homes um, than they're actually using and there's no point heating the areas or cooling the areas um, that you're not actually using. Effectively, you're uh, making your home smaller. And when it comes to energy use, small homes way outperform large homes. Uh, start with the really big energy guzzlers. Focus on those first um, because you'll get better improvements uh, right from the start. So uh, focus on hot water. Um, where does the energy come from to do that? And focus on uh, your refrigerator. How much does it use? Um, if you're looking, at, if if you are, uh, you know, if your fridge dies and you need to get uh, a replacement one, really focus on the efficiency of that one, um, and maybe trying to again make a small, get a smaller one because often they use a lot less power. Don't just trust the star ratings. Read how much power it actually uses, um, because a small one may have a lower star rating, uh, but actually use less total power than a large uh, refrigerator. Uh, Try to implement passive solar design where you can. Obviously, that's a lot more challenge uh, if you're in an existing building. But if you are thinking about building, then um, really uh, make sure that you um, use passive solar design to capture the most of that sun's energy in the winter and shade the house effectively in, um, in summer. You may want to investigate solar and home, home energy storage of some kind, um, but that really depends on your context. And maybe look at are there other alternative um, energies that are appropriate? So in our case, um, we live in a rural area uh, surrounded by working forests. Um, using timber to heat our home um, at some times of the year uh, makes sense. It makes sense in our context. I definitely don't suggest that that's an action that makes sense in, in everybody's context, excuse me. So by sorting out your energy, um, you again reduce the threat of natural disasters. Um, having alternative ways to heat your home, heat your water, cook your food and the like is um, super important if the grid does go down. Uh, it also potentially saves you money. Everybody right now is worried about energy prices. Um, they've been skyrocketing in Australia and around the world. Um, so by doing a bit of an audit and working out where you're wasting energy, it can really help um, your hip pocket. And finally, obviously, household energy uh, contributes, uh, energy use contributes massively to climate change. Um, think about where your electricity comes from and if you can transition to a climate positive or at least climate neutral source of electricity. So that's strategy number seven, sort out your energy use. Strategy number eight um, is be prepared. You know, hope for the best, um, but plan for the worst because you're never quite sure what's um, uh, going to happen. Um, I put this photo in here. This is a bit of personal experience that Kirsten Asher and I had a few years ago. Uh, Southeast Australia, as many of you know, was racked by massive bushfires and we were um, unlucky enough to be at the time visiting um, family in Malakuta. Um, in some senses, we were very lucky because we obviously, uh, we got through it all right and um, it gave us a lot of learnings into how we're now planning for major disasters. So that's an image of the home that we sheltered in, which was very prepared um, when that bushfire happened. It wasn't our home, it was a friend's home um, that we were, like I said, we were visiting family at a time and we sheltered in that place. Um, they had had planned for diversity. They had savings in place. Um, and I recommend that that's one of the things that you do is 
you know, save for a rainy day, make sure you have an emergency um, bank account that you keep away and, and to, um, to make your household more resilient. Um, and maintain a well-stocked pantry because in that case, we were three days, four days without, um, or longer than that actually, because Malakuta ended up getting cut off um, for weeks, which meant that the supermarkets were running out of food. Um, so it was, uh, they did the best job that they could in that little country town. But uh, the fact that we all had significant pantries full of food, um, we had a larder effectively, meant that it was much easier to get through that time. Another thing that's really helpful, um, educate yourself, you know, do a first aid course. Um, you never know when that's going to come in handy. And we recommend joining your local volunteer emergency services. We were very lucky in the sense that my brother-in-law, who was sharing that house with us at the time, or living in that house with us for that period, um, he uh, had joined the local fire service and we got a lot of up-to-date information that we wouldn't have otherwise got without that community connection into um, the volunteer emergency services there. Um, it's a great way to connect with your community. Then identify what the most likely threat is in your context. Um, they're going to be different in each different um, place around the world. You know, we've seen flooding um, in the Northern Rivers um, of New South Wales just recently. Um, you know, fire is a threat where we are, uh, but maybe your threats are around uh, something else completely different. And once you've identified what that threat is, develop an emergency plan. It doesn't have to be huge. It's just a one pager which outlines what you're going to do and what your family's going to do, where you're going to shelter, um, where you're going to go, what you need to enact that plan. Um, it's very, very helpful in an emergency situation for everybody to be on the same page. So obviously this helps directly and specifically with natural disasters, um, but remembering that obviously these are also a huge threat to our uh, physical and our mental health. So uh, thinking about them beforehand and mentally preparing yourself for the possibility um, allows you to not worry about that in the back of your mind the rest of the time. And finally, this is a really powerful way to connect to your community. Um, connecting with volunteer fire services um, or volunteer emergency services in general is a really um, strong connection into community. So that's strategy number eight, uh, be prepared. Strategy number nine is build those connections. We think it's so important that we've actually raised that up to be a complete strategy by itself. Connect to your community and the land that you live on. Learn your local ecosystem, the plants, the animals and the waterways. Share food with other people so that you build those personal connections. And if possible, connect with the local indigenous community in your area. Um, we have universally found um, that people are um, so happy to, to bring us into community whenever we've reached out and said, we want to learn, we want to understand. Um, it's a very, very powerful way to help build connections. And then get politically active. Uh, the big challenges that we face are beyond us as individuals. It's all well and good to make as much change as you can in your personal life, but we need to influence the larger world. We need to get out there and uh, join with others to make political change. So we recommend a key part of this strategy is participating in community and finding the support you need, both the mental health support and um, the, the actual uh, physical support that you'll need in the case of some kind of breakdown of your household resilience. So obviously this um, builds links uh, and uh, that's the main part where this strategy helps to, to directly um, uh, mitigate one of the threats to household resilience, but it's also very, very powerful for your mental health. And it's also the only way that we're going to address the major challenges that face us in climate change and the climate crisis. Uh, we need to work uh, collectively to try to, to fix those problems. So that's strategy number nine, build connections. Uh, finally, I just want to point out that the way that it uh, that we actually are going to um, uh, make our way through major disasters is through the concept of mutual aid. Uh, the reciprocity that is formed when people are helping each other in community time and time again has been the way that communities have gotten through major disasters. 
You can't do this on your own. So look into mutual aid, learn a little bit more about that um, and uh, understand how powerful it can be uh, to provide for communities when, um, you know, when trouble strikes. The reality is community is resilience. It's how we're going um, to deal with all of these threats. This is a beautiful image. It was made by uh, Daliella. Uh, check her out on Instagram. Um, uh, she's got incredible uh, liner cut prints of all kinds of different things, um, all right around these themes. Um, follow her if you don't already. Uh, so that was strategy number nine. The final strategy, strategy number 10, uh, where you think it's super important that you practice self-care. Um, you, all you can do is start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. As the famous African-American tennis player Arthur Ashe said, you know, resilience requires you to be rested. Um, you can't take on this responsibility all yourself. You need to pace yourself. This is a huge list of actions and not all of them are appropriate for your context. We think the strategies overall can be adapted to each person's different um, context. It's key that you don't approach these as big tasks that you need to accomplish straight away. Um, instead, we want you to focus on creating positive habits. Uh, that's really what our permaculture living course is, is all about. Uh, we focus very much on creating good habits that you can um, integrate into your life. And the reality is you're going to fail to achieve a lot of these things. Everybody does. Nobody's perfect. So when um, when you do you know, decide to go out for a meal or whatever, um, don't get down on yourself. Practice self-forgiveness. Uh, Recognise um, that you're doing the best that you can. And to achieve, uh, to really you know, care for yourself, um, you need to reach out and have community. Make sure you continue to build those connections into your community and keep developing your own knowledge base um, so that you know how to both care for yourself and the others around you. Um, this is super important for our mental health um, and super important uh, when we're considering how much to connect with um, or how we can address that threat of disconnection. Um, yeah, so that's strategy number 10, practice self-care. So there you have it. Uh, this is Milkwood's top 10 strategies for household resilience. Uh, they are decrease your buy-in, cook food at home, grow some food, feed, feed the soil, preserve the harvest, get water wise, sort out your energy, be prepared for um, major disasters when they do happen, build connections into community, and finally, practice self-care. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we've got a heap more resources um, uh, coming your way tomorrow. So uh, we've got a recording of this presentation um, and the slideshow. We've got links to all the free downloads that I mentioned, like there's literally dozens of them. Uh, PDF checklists and videos that you can watch, how-tos on specific actions that you can take. Um, and a very special offer for our upcoming permaculture living course. Uh, and that is all coming to you in your inbox um, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, we've got 15 minutes left for our Q&A. Um, I'm just gonna go uh, grab a drink. And while I do that, I'd just like to um, show you a little uh, video, which is just goes into a little detail about the permaculture living course. Right back in about uh, two, minutes. Okay, there's a lot going on on this planet of ours. So what can you do? You can rise up and let your voice be counted and then you need to go home at the end of the day and make some soup. Now, about that soup, what if you could grow all the ingredients in it? What if you could transform your home into a place full of sun-filled nooks and green growing things so at the end of your day you could nourish yourself and the planet? What if you could learn effective strategies to connect to your community and help build strength and resilience for everyone what if you could live a permaculture life? 
You could learn to forage and build things and make things and connect, really connect with this beautiful planet of ours, even while you fight and advocate and do everything you can to make a better world. Welcome to Permaculture Living, our new online program designed to help you kickstart your permaculture life. In this course, you'll gain the skills you need to start living like it matters, no matter where you are. We've taken over 10 years of permaculture living and learning, skills and design, and packed it down into a program for you. By the time you finish, you'll have loads of new skills and have a fundamental understanding of permaculture principles, thanks to David Holmgren, the co-originator of permaculture, that you can use every day to make the world, your world, a better place. We're all living in a world out of balance. This we know. The solutions are both large scale and small scale, both at once. And so with this course, we invite you to learn how to live a permaculture life, one that nourishes you and your community and the soil on which you stand. Because it's from this place that you can truly make a difference while keeping your head on straight and your body nourished and your garden and your community thriving. Sound good? Let's do this. So, um, excellent. We've got a bunch of questions coming through. Not a huge, huge amount. Uh, maybe I explained things a little too well, but um, yeah, feel free to ask them as we go along and I'll, I'll see if we can get to them. Um, I don't mind uh, answering questions about specific um, actions, you know, things like growing mushrooms or uh, any, you know, major gardening questions about what type of gardening um, you prefer or anything like that. Um, so I've got some good ones uh, coming through that I'll do my best to answer. Um, this is one from uh, Jody Robinson. Um, are there any good testing kits for food, soil and water safety um, that you use? Okay, uh, so I think I'll answer this in sort of two parts. The first is uh, that uh, although, you know, often we um, are very concerned about, you know, toxicity levels in the food that we grow or the water that we harvest uh, or the soil in our backyards, um, I just want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page, that most of the food that is grown um, commercially is not really subject to a lot of testing either. So don't assume that your food is um, going to be, you know, in a worse position than um, some of the food that you would normally buy. Uh, the reality is often, often it's not tested as well. So, um, uh, as far as testing your own food, I do think it's worth well testing the soil, uh, particularly that you're growing your food in. So I'm not sure where you are, Jody, but in Australia, there's a fantastic program called VegSafe um, that uh, tests particularly for heavy metal toxicity in soil, and that's super important if you're in a inner city, an older inner city suburb. Um, otherwise, you really need to test for specific pollutants, which can get quite challenging uh, because you need to know a little bit about the history of your place. Um, as far as water, um, there, are, there are a bunch of different labs that will test water quality for you. Filters work really well um, at reducing um, a lot of the toxicity in, in your water. Uh, and as far as testing for your food, uh, most of us hopefully are getting food from a whole bunch of diverse places. So we're kind of uh, using that strategy of diversity as a way of uh, reducing our risk. It's, it's gonna be difficult for you to test for every potential pollutant in every different bit of food uh, that you have. I hope that helps, Jody. Okay, uh, next question that we've got is uh, from Simone. Or Simone. Um, is it worth growing lentils or chickpeas in your backyard? I'd love to supply at least some of my needs for these. Um, it does depend a little bit on where you live. Uh, again, if you live somewhere a little bit, um, uh, you know, both both lentils and chickpeas can be grown as a, as a, a summer annual, uh, but particularly normally grown in warmer climates. Um, but uh, particularly chickpeas are, are actually a, a pretty um, uh, fast growing and very productive crop. Uh, we grow a lot of pulses and beans um, for storage. And um, there's something absolutely beautiful about the wealth of running your hands through a big um, 
uh, you know, container, a big bowl or a bucket of uh, dried beans or, or lentils or chickpeas. So there are a bunch of different um, uh, pulses, beans um, that you can grow uh, in every different climate, basically. So you might have to look at whether lentils or chickpeas are the most appropriate, um, but you can definitely grow uh, some great beans, dried storage beans, um, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, so yeah, um, you, it's not going to happen in a tiny garden. You're going to need uh, a few square meters at least uh, dedicated to each of those each of those crops. I uh, hope that hope hope that helps, someone. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, Lynn. Um, great question. How do you find a microclimate on your property? So for those of you who haven't heard the term microclimate before, uh, it's about uh, finding a spot in your yard which is either cooler or wetter or warmer or drier than average in your yard uh, or in your garden um, so or on your property. So uh, the classic sort of first microclimate to, that most people look for is a warm microclimate to allow you to grow uh, plants that really need summer heat. Uh, a lot of people uh, in the cooler places are looking for that warm microclimate to put for example, grow uh, tomatoes or eggplants or, or chilies. Um, we have a great microclimate on our place because we've got an 80s brick veneer house that we've been retrofitting. We have a very tall brick wall um, that faces directly towards the equator. So because we're in, in Southern Literuita, um, the, the equator is a long way north of us. This brick wall faces north. And all over the winter months, the low sun in the sky shines down onto that brick wall and it keeps it very warm. So it means that at the start of the growing season in spring, that soil warms up quicker and any plants are in that warm microclimate. So the first place to find a microclimate is look for things that store heat, massive things store heat, and look for aspect facing towards the equator is usually going, a wall facing towards the equator is going to provide a really warm microclimate. Now each different type of microclimate will have different ways to find it. So um, yeah, maybe you're looking for a breeze, maybe um, you're looking for a spot that gets enough chill hours to grow a peach in a warm climate. Um, so they're all, you know, probably the best way to find those microclimates is just getting outside and observing. On that sunny winter's day, go and look for that warm sheltered spot. On that cold, um, uh, winter's morning, go and look for that frosty spot to plant the peach tree. Uh, hope that helps, Lynn. Okay, got a question from Valerie, uh, which is, where are you based and is your permaculture living course relevant to the subtropical climate? So uh, we're based in, in southern Tasmania, um, so we're about as far south as you can go in Australia, um, and we're clearly in a maritime temperate climate. Uh, the subtropical climate is the, it's not quite tropical, it's below tropical, it's, um, it's, uh, it is actually a temperate climate designation and often in subtropical climates um, the, the key thing is we don't get freezes. We might get occasional frosts but we don't get freezes. So uh, we're not that different from the subtropical climate. We don't get um, uh, the summer rains that the subtropics do, instead our rains are in the winter. Um, but in our permaculture living course, we've designed it um, to be appropriate for people living in as many different contexts as possible from uh, contexts such as, you know, deep urban environments through to rural landowners um, from uh, tropical uh, climates much warmer uh, than the subtropics through to, um, you know, the cold climates of the Northern Hemisphere. We've got people who are, and we've got students from Iceland and Norway, and we've got students from Malaysia and Singapore and India, um, 72 different countries. And uh, one thing that we've, we've, we've really never had feedback that the course um, wasn't appropriate for their climate. So um, I hope that answers your question, Valerie. Uh, Great question, Sarah. Uh, this is one that um, we get asked a lot. Um, Sarah says, we have an abundance of wonderful wildlife that eat everything and anything and everything that I put in the ground, and they are quite determined. Is there a low cost solution to have a veggie garden or space without significant fencing infrastructure? Um, so yes, there is. Um, we, we have 
two of them. We have one of them right now, and on Saturday I'm going to uh, augment the first one with a second one, and that's a puppy. Uh, little dogs do an amazing job at discouraging wildlife from your vegetable garden. Now, permaculture is about taking responsibility for partly responsibility for your own needs. Uh, and um, that includes, you know, having a space where you can grow things. We also, that, that allows us to set aside as much space as possible for the natural world. In our case, we have a backyard and we have a front yard. The front yard, the wallabies live in there. The, um, we've got quolls that live in there. We've got possums everywhere. You can go out there on any night and into that little bit of native bush and there are so many native animals. But our backyard is protected by two Jack Russell crosses. Um, they're fantastic, amazing animals at uh, chasing away any wildlife that comes into the yard. Um, they've never caught anything. Uh, or Koji, our little one, he's never caught anything. Uh, on Saturday, he's getting a little brother uh, to come help him out. Um, but they are really, really effective uh, if you don't want to spend money on insulating uh, or isolating your garden using a fence of some kind. Uh, so it's really pretty much one of those two. I, th I think um, complete exclusion using some sort of um, cover slash fencing and or having some kind of animal. There are a lot of other options out there. Um, I've never seen a, techno a technology based one work particularly effectively. Uh, I've got maybe time for one more question. Um, a great question from Nanette. Thanks, Nanette. Uh, the her question is, I live in a townhouse and I can only grow things in containers. I have a balcony, but it's facing west, which limits what I can grow. Can permaculture still apply in these conditions? Um, totally. I mean, permaculture is about thinking at that strategic level what kind of strategy is going to work best. It's not just about choosing uh, what to grow or um, or when to grow it. it. It is also about, you know, the bigger picture decisions. Is it is it better for you to try to engage in local community garden or, or a local box scheme as supplying a significant amount of your, your veggies or your food compared with struggling trying to grow them yourself in a small, less than perfect environment? Um, but nonetheless, even on a west facing balcony, there are definitely some things that you can grow quite, quite well. I would start uh, with Mediterranean herbs, uh, things that can dry out because you've probably only got a small amount of soil, things that can handle drying out a little bit, um, and things that don't mind that direct sun and the heat. So Mediterranean herbs, you could even grow cherry tomatoes over the over the um, the summer months. Um, there are a bunch of different things that you can grow on a west facing uh, a balcony. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming along today. Uh, like um, I mentioned earlier, you're going to get an email in your inbox um, tomorrow. Look out for that. Um, there's a bunch of great resources. Uh, Kirsten's been putting a huge amount of work into those over the last um, week or so. Uh, so look out for them. Um, thank you so much for coming along uh, to our workshop today. Um, thank you to Kirsten and to Bell and to Paul for helping out in the chat. Uh, Tell anyone that uh, you want, send them along to tonight's one. It's going to happen in seven hours from now, wherever you are in the world. So seven hours from right now, we're going to be doing the whole thing again from scratch. Um, let your friends know that they can join for free and pass on that link um, that you used to uh, join up for it originally. And we'd love to see them there. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, uh, keep an eye out for the Milkwood newsletter because uh, we're going to keep doing uh, more of these workshops. Uh, you'll see them on a whole bunch of different topics that we've got planned coming up over the next year or so. So uh, see you all soon. Bye. <laughs>